Uh, very good afternoon to one and all present today. Thank you so much for joining Inform Sense History Chapter. Uh, this is our uh, fifth event uh, in this spring semester. Today, it gives me immense pleasure again to welcome uh, Patrick Murray, who is, uh, many of you might be aware, he's in our department as an executive coach. He's coaching the undergrad, master's, and PhD student. Let me take this privilege to introduce uh, Patrick uh, and his background and how we got this uh, set up today is going to talk about the circular economy. Patrick Murray is actually our alum from Edward P. Fitz Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering. He's, uh, he graduated in the year 1988 and immediately after that he joined Intel Corporation. So over 34 years he spent his entire career with the Intel Corporation in various profiles starting from an applications engineer, then planning engineer, and then moved to sales and operations, sales and marketing. He was into retail sales, and slowly he climbed up to the leadership roles. And before he retired, he was a vice president. He was looking after uh, world sales on a retail, uh, I mean, retail sales in the entire globe for uh, Intel and Intel products. So uh, we welcome you, sir, on behalf of uh, our Inform Sense to chapter. Uh, after retirement, uh, he joined the uh, ISC department uh, in the board and he is, you know, coaching our students. Many of you might have attended his program, typically resume corrections and how to prepare for interviews and stuff. If not so far, maybe in the future, you can just send him an email, uh, set up a timeline and he will be very much interested to help you guys. So I had an opportunity during my initial first few years. We had good interactions. He has taken us out for lunch as well. Thank you so much for that. So today, um, Patrick is going to talk about um, um, his interest on circular economy. Many of you might not be aware of circular economy. It is primarily on a reverse logistics and reverse supply chain. I don't want to give much details on the topic. So Patrick will going to introduce on that. He is going to explain the concepts, what are all the opportunities available for industrial and systems engineers, and how we uh, develop a career prospect in uh, circular economy or reverse logistics or reverse supply chain in the future. So he has recently started and joined this uh, club called the Circular Economy Club in the, in the NC State in Raleigh's uh, chapter. So if anyone is interested to know more about it and wanted to join and contribute, probably you can contact us. Sir, I again, uh, once again, welcome you and the stage is yours. Uh, please take us through circular economy. All right, thank you. I'm very glad to be here. Did you wanna get a uh, picture first? Yes, I think that would be yeah. better. We will start with that. I request all the participants to open your camera. I um, mean, some shutters. Uh, so that we'll quickly take a picture. Okay. Tejaswini Rajagopal. Zhu, you are taking it. Unmute yourself and you give the count. Done? All, All right. right. Fantastic. Please. All right, so let me go ahead and get my uh, presentation up. And I got to I got to adjust the screen. Okay. So, thank you very much for being here. I'm I am Glad to have this opportunity to share something with all of you that has uh, become important to me. Um, as Srinivasan said, I spent 30 years at Intel. During that time, I actually wasn't involved in anything directly related to the circular economy. However, I was fairly aware of the amount of e-waste that was coming out of the electronics industry. And of course, Intel being a supplier of microprocessors and other chips into the electronics industry, um, you know, it, was, it was hard not to be aware of the amount of e-waste that was happening. And as I left my career, I started to investigate, so what, what could be done about it? And through that course, I learned that really it's not just about the disposal, but there is a new way of thinking about how to deal with reducing waste, and more importantly, a way of being able to increase the profitability and viability of corporations where new businesses can be created as well. And more importantly, how do we, how do we save the planet? 
uh, through these actions. So that's kind of how I came about this and I've taken a lot of courses. Uh, one other note that I'll say is Srinivasan will send out a PDF of this presentation afterwards. Uh, towards the end, I do have a number of links in there in case you have any interest in following up on any of the opportunities I, I, I do talk about. Uh, so you'll have that opportunity. Meanwhile, please feel free to, to unmute and uh, ask questions as we go. Um, I should be done in about an hour's time, and then we'll have uh, uh, the remaining time available for, for questions. But please feel free if, if something comes up along the way, ask me. So here's what I hope to do today. Um, introduce you to this, what the circular economy is, why it matters, um, what some of the key principles are of implementing the circular economy, and a little bit about the momentum that has started and is really snowballing um, around the world and inside of companies. And of course, that creates opportunities for careers um, whenever there's a, a growing new you know, interest area or mandate that companies and, and government entities have. So through the course of the discussion, although I think some of it's gonna be obvious to you, I do have a couple of uh, instances where I talk about specific skills that are valued by uh, companies and governments and other agencies that are, are interested in, in implementing uh, and taking advantage of what the circular economy is. And then if I've created some interest in you and in following up after this presentation, I'll describe kind of the call to action to, to everyone to get involved and in how you can actually engage and move forward to perhaps learn more, or perhaps uh, you know, build a set of uh, skills and capabilities that will allow you to be more marketable to companies that are looking to hire uh, people to further their activities in the circular economy. All right, so first, before I go, um, the circular economy is a term that I will use. It has now become the most adopted term throughout the world um, in explaining this. However, there have been terms that have been used to explain a very, very similar concept and, and most, most importantly, the same goal. So if you've heard of things like cradle to cradle, which has been around, I think, since the 60s, biomimicry and things like that, very, very common principles, just different names, all trying to accomplish the same goal. So what is that goal? Let's talk about it. To understand today's economy, I got this very, very simple flow. Um, that should be fairly obvious to, to all of us. Right now, you've got enterprises that take resources from the earth in the form of raw, real raw materials and minerals. Those go into a chain where parts and components get created, and then products are then made from that. Those products are sold and then used, and then when they're no longer of use, it get, gets thrown into the waste, into a landfill. Right, they're just disposed of. So it's a very linear way of having material flow from raw materials all the way to a landfill or disposal. Right, you think of it simply take, make, use, and waste, and that's kind of what exists today. There is some recycling, you know. I mean, it's not like um, um, nothing, uh, or it's a hundred percent linear. Uh, of course, there's some recycling when it comes to plastics and glass and some other things, um, but quite frankly, not very much. And as a result of, you know, these uh, centuries of following this methodology of, of our, our economy, a lot of things get created. But, you know, I talk about some recycling, only 14% of all plastic packaging is recycled globally, which means there's a, a, a ton in up in the landfills, as I'm sure you're aware of. A lot of things get made and don't get used. In Europe, the average car sits unused 92% of the time. You know, phenomenal st statistic. And then the one that, that I mentioned here, because NC State does have a very strong uh, textiles uh, college, is that for every second, a garbage truck full of textiles, clothing, is put into a landfill or burned, which means uh, uh, toxics going into, uh, into the atmosphere. Every second, a garbage truck full. Right, so that's a, a, a phenomenal way of thinking about the impact of this linear economy that we live in today. And let's let's go back a little bit more, right, of, of why this linear economy, it, 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 it's not sustainable, right? The, the population, which means more things are needed, more things are used, is growing faster than the raw materials 
that the earth can provide us, right? Of all these minerals and key assets or, you know, fossil fuels that are abused in so many products these days, we will eventually run out. Before we even run out, they're going to become very, very expensive, right? That, that standard uh, supply demand scarcity model. And, you know, that, that is having, that is creating such a toll on the earth and it will create a toll when it comes to the, the cost of manufacturing products. So that, that's one big problem of the current economy. Additionally, there's the environmental stresses that occur from that. You know, if you're burning, you know, a garbage truck full of textiles every day, the gases and toxins that get released into the, into the air, or when you dispose of things into the landfill and it leaches into the water table and gets into the water system, right? That is impacting um, our quality of life. It's creating medical issues and things like that because you've got all these elements that are now entering into the earth that don't sustain the earth, but actually harm the earth, right? So that's another effect uh, that the linear economy is having. And then last, and this is where the economy part comes into, and while this is not an economics uh, discussion in and of itself, you, it, even though you're an engineer, you're always doing something uh, in, a, in a role in the economy, is that these minerals that are extracted from the earth and that are used to create components and parts and products, the value that that raw material, that raw mineral has, that potential value is being discarded because that mineral is being used linearly, it's getting rid of, whereas there's an opportunity to get more value out of uh, any of those raw materials that, that come from the earth. And you can do that by, by extending the life of, or the, I'm sorry, extending the use of those raw materials. And that's what we're gonna talk about going forward. So is there something that, you know, as scientists and engineers, we can think of that is not linear, right? that does not just take from the earth, create harm into the earth, but is there a different ecosystem that perhaps can be modeled after? So I've picked a, a cherry blossom tree from Japan known as the, with the beautiful Sakura blossoms. And I think it's a pretty good example of how the earth in and of itself has its own kind of way of sustaining itself. In the springtime, you get these beautiful blossoms. Of course, it's all celebrated. And after about two weeks, these blossoms die, they return to the soil and they become nutrients to sustain the life of the tree. And then the cycle repeats. So it's a very, very nice circular way of how the earth itself, nature um, can create things. And then from that, create nutrients to allow things to, to grow and, and, and flourish again. So with that premise of looking at the natural ecosystem, how can that be applied to the economy that we're used, used to, which is extracting uh, materials from the ground, making things from it, using it, and then what do we do when we're done with it? On the left side of this chart, and this is a, a chart that's been, been in use for um, about a decade now, but really refined by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and this is why it's become so popular worldwide, is it's fairly uh, under, or easily understood. On the left side is really talking about the circular economy and representing kind of food and agriculture, right? And kind of looking at that closed loop of how that would work. So how do we apply that to the manufacturing of goods? Can we find circular systems, circular loops inside of that take, make, use, and discard, right? To get more value out of the raw materials that are pulled from the earth. And so there's a couple of key principles that these loops represent. I'm gonna dive into each one a little bit, but you can see where it starts with the materials coming down the middle, they get developed into a product, the product gets used by the user. And then from that, that product, what happens from there? In the linear economy, it gets disposed. But there are opportunities where that product can be reused the product can be maintained and prolonged its useful life, right? We can resell it, we can redistribute it, we can refurbish it, remanufacture it, right? And put it back into the chain, or we can recycle the products. We can, we can kind of disassemble the product, decompose it down into its raw materials, 
right? And then enter back at the beginning of the supply chain, right? Removing the need for as much raw materials coming from the earth. That's the one that is probably most familiar because of glass and paper and bottles that we throw into a recycling container. But that's just one of the principles, one of the ways of being able to get more value out of the materials we're pulling from the earth. Okay, let me take a quick pause. Any, any questions to this point? All right, now let me deep, do a little bit of a deep dive into each one of these principles and loops. So first is the share, right? And I think many of you are probably familiar with some of these. Ownership means waste. Remember that statistic I showed you, shared about Europe, where 92% of the time a car is not used, right? So ownership can often mean waste. Ways of going around that, bike share programs, car share programs. Uh, Renault just announced that they were having a new line of cars come out that is a non-ownership model. So in other words, if you want to drive that car, you don't own the car. Renault owns the car, but they're providing a subscription service that gives you access to a fleet of cars, right? And there's this idea of being able to, oh, uh, ooh, sorry. I uh, hit the wrong button. Apologies for that. Okay, here we go. So um, there's this also this principle of instead of owning, you borrow the stuff you need, and then when you when you don't need it, you lend it out, right? So some examples here that again may be familiar. You know, there's a car rental service called Toro. You know, you bought a car. You may not need it all the time. Perhaps you've bought an, uh, an extra car that you just want as a weekend driver. Well, during the week, you can rent that out. So Toro provides a service to connect people who have a car that aren't using it to people that need a, a short-term use of a car. RV share is a great example. You know, an RV, you talk about a product that may get used just a, a couple of weeks out of the year. What's it doing for the remainder? RV share is a service platform that allows people that own RVs not using them to connect with people that would like to use it for a week and take their family on a vacation. Same with houses, home away, vacation by rental. And then something new that that is emerging pretty strongly in Europe um, is a, a, a service called Fat Llama. And what they do, you don't have to always think of expensive things like cars and RVs and homes, is they provide a service to make it easier to loan out tools you don't always use. You know, you might know someone, maybe a family member that at one time was needed to do a project and bought maybe a table saw, you know, something, something that is not, you know, that gets used maybe once or twice a year, but not used the rest of the time. Now, wouldn't there be a great way of, of being able to allow others that need an occasional use of a table saw to find someone that they can uh, uh, borrow it from and maybe pay for a service? So there's an emerging opportunity beyond just cars and homes and RVs um, and bike share programs to go even further down into what might be in the house and connect those people that need something maybe once, maybe just a couple of times with someone that owns it, right? So what you're doing is you're getting more use out of that product uh, rather than you just owning it for yourself and, and using it occasionally. So that's, that's the first principle of share. The next principle or way of closing the loop is maintaining or prolonging. And that's all about how do we have the product that get made have longer value, be functional longer, right? Ways you do that is you make it easy to repair, right? A big thing that's going on right now and a big movement, again, driven out of Europe primarily, is products are being designed with the intent to repair. I think if we take a pause and think about a lot of very common products that have been built over the past couple decades specifically, they're impossible to repair. You got to take them to a specialized shop or maybe you have to take it back to the manufacturer. You know, they may be making things thinner, lighter, more specialized, um, which makes it very, very difficult to open, you know, for uh, someone to open it up or maybe even a repair shop. So there are ways to design a product with the intention that it will be repaired and it will have a longer lifetime. In some jurisdictions, there's a movement called the right to repair. Some companies, you know, are making it difficult to repair the product 
and not just because they don't have screws and fasteners and things like that to open up, but they're not even making available product manuals. They're not even making available spare parts. You have to take it back to their authorized service center to do it. So right to repair laws that are happening, even in the United States, the state of Massachusetts did that around cars, said, you own the car, you should have the right to repair it and to take it whoever you want to get it repaired, not just to the dealer, but you can take it to a local shop and that local shop must have access to repair manuals, spare parts, tools that may be required to repair that. In the bottom left, there's a little cartoon uh, out of the UK of an initiative that they're trying to drive, which would actually put an indicator on the box that would tell the purchaser before you buy it, how easy is it to repair? To influence people's thinking, those people that care about getting the most value, the most life um, out of an expensive purchase, even though a coffee pot may not seem expensive to some people it is, or how do I keep this coffee pot from ending up in a landfill in five years time? If it's easy to repair, that might be more attractive. So we're seeing things like that happen. It opens up new businesses. You know, when you've got the ability to repair, there are companies being formed like Fix-It Clinic, providing a shop, if you will, with the tools, other experts that allow you to fix your product. Maybe have access to spare parts and, and access to manuals. Now, another part about maintaining and prolong is how do you add capabilities to that product over time? You know, you think about smartphones, most of us probably have them. When you realize, oh, the camera's not very good, this is not where the battery's pack's not working very good, you get begin thinking, do I repair it or do I toss it out and buy a new one? There's a company called Fairphone in Europe that has developed a modular camera platform, which if you buy it, over time, you can add different cameras to it, maybe improving the resolution, different batteries, different screens even. So it's a modular product design that can prolong the life of that product that you've bought. I would even argue to some degree, Tesla cars are somewhat, you know, have a longer life opportunity to it because there's so much of it that is a software-based platform. Tesla can add capabilities over the air by downloading new capabilities to that car. Right? You don't have to go buy a new car to have full self-driving. They've got the platform there. They will offer it as a software download uh, over time. And then Ford, you know, Ford, you think of Ford, yeah, cars have been repairable for a long time. I, I put Ford here, not because they've done anything to make it difficult to repair cars, although they have gotten more complicated, but I've put Ford down here because they've done something interesting. Historically, when Ford builds a new model of car, and they usually do it around a chassis thing that lasts a couple of years, they tend to have to forecast and make how many spare parts of each component they think they will need. And they have to build it when they're building that new car because the tooling's in place. They go to a new model, oftentimes that means retooling, which means they can't build that same part again. So Ford is now uh, adopting a strategy and beginning to implement where they are deploying, you know, additive manufacturing machines in different places so that if a sp spare part is needed for a car that they no longer manufacture, they can make that part, right? That has some other benefits to it in terms of not using a lot of raw materials to build a bunch of brake calipers that may never get used or having to ship those around the world. And uh, the transportation and, and environmental costs that come with that. So it, it's not just about designing for repair and right to repair. You can use other principles around additive manufacturing that change the logistics, change the use of raw materials, right? In the repair domain, okay? So now let's talk about the next loop, which is reuse and redis redistribute. So that is you got a product, right? Or some materials. How do multiple owners get to use that same product in its original form, right? Well, resale is one way. I think most of us are probably familiar with, with eBay. So you use something, you're done with it. How do I resell it to someone else who wants it, right? That's pretty common. But it's now extending in a lot of other places. A company called uh, Tam Hangers, right? We're using coat hangers, you know, out of uh, laundry mats and things like that. You know, reapply. How do I do enterprise IT asset? 
things to better optimize and deploy inside an organization. Companies in the furniture business, office furniture and so forth. I put IT Renew on here. They're in the middle, fairly new company, but this company was born out of the principle of the circular economy. Their job, their, their, their business, I should say, is to go work with the big cloud service providers. They're, they're the companies that have cloud storage, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, Google. And this is a business I know well in their cloud data centers. You know, they typically only use those CPUs for about two years. And they have to refresh them because they need the latest performance or even lower power requirements uh, in microprocessors. You get the benefit of more, profound, more performance and lower power uh, with subsequent generations. So they have an average use of a, of a CPU, a server a microprocessor, of about two years and really that whole board that goes with it. So what IT Renew has done is they've worked deals with those companies to actually take the server boards out of their data centers and then resell those to other companies that may not need you know today's latest and greatest highest performing you know lowest power microprocessor to run their business right so they've actually created a business with circular economy principles to reuse and redistribute products that are not of value to one company but could be a very high value to another company and it's not just uh, uh, these kind of products. Each in the consumer thing, Patagonia's done something very interesting, and they've they've built a business around it called their Warnware program. So you buy a Patagonia jacket, you wear it, you use it. They will now take it back from you, and they will resell it. You know, you get some discount or something like that. They've got in different deals uh, around that, but they will actually take the product back instead of it being in one of those garbage trucks every second take the product back and resell it to customers who want a Patagonia product, might value environmental impact a lot, or maybe want that product at a lower cost and are willing to, to uh, have a used jacket that still works and still functional. Okay. So these are some examples of companies employing that principle of the circular economy. If we go a step fur further, there's this principle of refurbish and remanufacture. So this is a product that has been in use. You can't really sell it as used. Maybe it's got some functional, some wear and tear to it. So how do I kind of break down, tear down that product a little bit into its key component parts and then rebuild it and, and resell it or maybe release it? Caterpillar is probably uh, one of the leading companies that have done this in some of their heavy equipment. They actually have a, a program called Cat Reman or Remanufacture, where they actually will take back engines and drivetrains and transmissions and other, you know, heavy components. Will completely refurbish those those products and then rebuild it into a new piece of, of heavy equipment product that will then be resold at a bit of a discount because people are getting you know a product with some used materials in it. But they have that ability to take product back, resell it in the form of a different product or a newer product without having to use raw, more raw materials. And oftentimes for someone like Caterpillar, the energy that's required, you know, to take raw iron and aluminum, smelt it, and then create an engine block out of it. So they've actually found this to be a, 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 a big cost savings for them as well, not just for the environment, but for themselves. And there are other companies that are doing this. IKEA has announced that they're starting to do this with some furniture. And then you have companies like Retech, which does it for consumer electronics things, or GameStop. I know they've been in the news lately for a different reason, but GameStop found a whole new business opportunity for themselves by taking in old gaming platforms, old Xboxes and Playstations, refurbishing them, and then reselling them. And that's become a very profitable uh, business for GameStop. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity there um, uh, if one thinks about it. Now let's talk about the last key principle, the last loop, which is recycle, which is the one that everyone's probably most familiar with. But that is taking a product back, completely breaking it down, and then breaking those components and parts down to basically the base material or raw material, and then bringing it back at the beginning of the supply chain in place of any raw materials that may come from, from the earth. Lots of companies are doing this. Again, it's it's uh, very common um, and embraced by a lot of uh, a lot of companies. 
um, in in some ways uh, the easiest to do because a lot of that recycling breakdown uh, is is done is actually performed by third parties. Okay, so those are all the key principles. Now, if I map those to the existing process, I expect I expanded a little bit on that take, make, use, and, and discard. I expanded this a little bit to start mapping some of these, these uh, principal loops to it. So if I map that within product use, you know, we can repair and maintain it, upgrade it, resell it, right? We've got the ability to remanufacture and bring it back earlier into that process where it may fall into manufacturing, or maybe I use it in logistics if I break it apart a little bit and I've got some parts that don't need uh, substantial refurbishment, you got the return process, and of course, the recycle part, which is, you know, at the end of its life, you break it down into its raw materials. So that's how it fit in a standard manufacturing supply chain flow, mapping those principles. But what a number of companies, even existing companies have realized, is that it creates new business opportunities in the form of services. You got companies that are looking at my product is the service. I mentioned result, uh, Renault, right? What they're really selling is the use of a car. So the, the product isn't a car, but transportation is. And so they're selling their product as a service. For a monthly subscription fee, you get access to a, a, a new Renault car. So there are these new business models that are happening as one starts thinking about applying these principles of the circular economy to an existing business. Let me walk through what, what Rico did. Uh, Rico was, uh, a, a, if you're not familiar, but they're an office equipment supply company famous for printers and copiers and things like that. If I simplify their model, right, there are third party suppliers in blue of materials and parts. They get sent to Rico, all of Rico's uh, businesses in green, where they've got product manufacturing, some parts get sent off to the repair uh, uh, department and, and um, group inside of there. Products go get made, they get sold, they get delivered to the user. Sometimes repairs need to get made. And at the end of the life of the product, um, or, or it's too expensive to repair, the user disposes of, of that printer or copier or office good. What Rico did is they said, we need to basically reinvent how we do things. And they developed something called the green comet model. Again, the green bubbles here represent those actions, departments, groups inside of RICO and what they do. The blue represents third parties. So again, we're going to the user. We want to sell a product to a user. But now we have products coming in. They get made, they get sold. But along the way, they've put in place new process, additional processes that can maintain the copier. So now they can sell a copier as a service instead of as a product through a leasing arrangement or something like that. So it benefits Rico to get as much life out of that copier product as possible from that user. So they're incentivized to maintain that product. So even when they design and build it, they build it for longer life. If it's gotten close to the end of its life or the user doesn't need it anymore, the customer doesn't need it anymore, it, they put it in place a collection center to get that copier where then some decisions get made. Is this product still good? Does it just need a little cleanup or something like that? Yes, they get sent off to the product recovery center and then sales resells that, pro that copier. If the product, uh, I can't really clean it up and fix it a little bit um, and resell it, it gets sent to what they're calling the recycling center, but, but don't think of it in the classic recycling way. This is where a department and technicians will go look at it and say, ah, is this copier, does this product have enough parts in it that can be reused in some of the uh, products we're currently making? If so, they'll send it to a parts recovery center, which will then take out some of the components and parts that, are, that still have life. Maybe they do some refurbishment to it. Maybe they need uh, additive manufacturing to, um, to replace a few things and then get it in back into the manufacturing flow so that those parts that came out of a used product can be used now in a new product. And then for things that don't have any more life to it as a part, get sent off to a shredder company. Some of that resulting material can go back into the flow directly to the parts manufacturer who then can use some of the plastics or the nylons and things like that, some of the, the metals and, and use it in the future parts that Rico will buy for them. 
for that stuff that cannot be recovered, it goes off to other third parties that might be able to uh, find it on the open market or find use on the open market of recycled materials and so forth and so on. So what they've really done is they've reimagined their, their model from something linear to where they've implemented these loops, these principal loops to get product and parts back into their flow of their supply chain and manufacturing process. So it's pretty, it's pretty phenomenal. They reimagined it. And by the way, these, these groups, these, these green departments that didn't exist before created job opportunities, but it also created, you know, additional uh, profit benefits and cost reductions for the company. So as I walk through all those principal steps, I would imagine, you know, much like I did the first time I really kind of dug into understanding the circular economy that I did the, oh my God, a lot of the skills that we learn as industrial and systems engineers or operations research uh, people, a, a lot of those things that are needed to make that things happen are, are foundational skills that, that we learn. You know, we talked earlier about reverse logistics, right? And logistics in general. Right. How do you map all that flow of getting product back and then introducing it back into the supply chain? Right. And of course, supply chain and sourcing itself. How do you work with your suppliers? How do you work with your uh, other distributors and logistics teams to get things back and think about that, uh, that whole chain of custody of these of these products? Of course, these are all complex systems. And at the end of the day, what what IEs are good at is seeing complex systems, understanding it, being able to model it. Uh, even in mathematical models and figure out what's the most efficient way to get this done. To a lot of people that have been doing things in the old linear economy way, they, they can only see things one way. And as I use, we've got the foundational skill to be able to see the complex things and know if we make an adjustment here, what are the other effects of that? So we can go into an organization and say, there's a different way of doing it and we can make it more efficient along the way. I mentioned a few times the additive manufacturing that might be needed for re for spare parts if you're Ford, right? Instead of having to build a whole bunch in advance and hope that you guess right, um, so you're not wasting stuff and you're not wasting inventory and space and things like that. How can I apply additive manufacturing and logistics expertise you know, into that to, to completely change the dynamic for them? And of course, inventory management, right? Because you're gonna have more products and more parts and more components that you're dealing with in the supply chain right? That, that requires inventory management skills, right? And I'm kind of guessing a lot of you guys have thought about that. All right. So I've walked through the principles, why it matters uh, to the earth. And of course, the always question is, is it really viable, right? Do, do, do companies really want to do this? Is this we, uh, Rico's green comment? There was a lot more green bob blobs on there, which means more people, more departments, more complexity. Uh, so how does it really work? Is it viable for a company? So here's a very simple business case that the World Economic Forum did with uh, a, a European um, uh, hand tool manufacturer. And it's a drill. So they, they picked one product, they picked a drill. The as is linear economy situation is such that if they want to manufacture a thousand of them and, and sell them at $70 each and sell them in, in the European Union, right? What's the breakdown for them? So they make, they sell a thousand at 70 each, $70,000 of revenue. Then you've got their component costs and they're left with a margin of $26. Now, if you start thinking a little bit of, with the circular economy principle, well, what if I had the ability to collect some of these units, refurbish them and then resell them? Of course at a discount, but, but can I resell say 20% of, of my plan? you know, as a refurbished unit. So I'm only building 800 new ones. I'm refurbishing and selling 200 of them at a discounted price. What does that mean in terms of my financials? Well, my revenues have gone down, of course, right? But my material costs have gone down. My labor costs have gone down, right? So I actually make, the company actually makes a little bit more money, thousand more dollars off of that, right? And that's just in the refurbishment scenario. If we take that further and say, Let's refurbish, right? Let's recycle the other ones, get some material recovery costs, reduce the, you know, input cost to the whole system. You know, same kind of scenario of how many units I'm going to sell. Well, same revenue, but my margin goes up because my material costs have lowered by over half. 
All right, so we're building a pretty good case here. And then if I do the full loop, right, and then I'm really focused on using those refurbished drills to go reach new customers at the lower price, or if it's not priced because they're, you know, environmentally sensitive, uh, 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 sensitive, right? I may be able to reach a new customer base. So now I'm selling a lot more power drills and my margin goes significantly up. So by just on a simple product, like a power drill, if we apply all four principles to this, the corporate profits go up significantly by 40%. So that's a, a business case of how applying these principles can increase the profit for a, a simple company. But oftentimes that's not enough. That's, that's not enough. You, you have to go out and go tell thousands of companies for you know the thousands of products that they make, uh, build that case for each one of them. So what's important is public policy and what's happening around the world. And the momentum has really started you know, about five years ago, and it is getting a full head of steam. You got the World Economic Forum that has as one of their platforms adopting and spreading the word on applying the circular economy. The platform is called Shaping the Future of Global Public Goods, right? It's their platform that they communicate to organizations, countries, companies. 150 global companies are directly involved in sponsoring this work. Right. So it, it's happening, you know, at a global level. That's often not enough. What about at a regional level? Well, the the European Commission right, and the EU has actually set targets for all their member countries of how they need to recycle and reuse product to get more value out of it and help the earth. So they've put in place some very, very concrete steps and targets that their member countries need to hit. And that's causing a lot of action because then companies, if they want to participate in the selling of goods and services in those countries, right, they've got to show how what they do and how they're doing it, right, help those countries meet those targets, right? So, you know, they get a, they get a, a leading edge there. To help make that happen, the European Union's made available a billion dollars through grants for companies, universities, countries, cities to go accelerate these innovative ideas and adopt these key principles inside of the things that they do, right? So there's a lot of money, there's a lot of money being put on the table that companies can go get at some early funding to figure out how to adopt and implement the principles out of the circular economy. Again, that's not enough even at the city level. And I've just got a couple of examples here. I think there's a uh, hundred cities around the world that have something around implementing the circular economy. You may not say it as such. It might talk about, you know, particular things in terms of product sharing, in terms of new services, in terms of reusing waste and things like that, where they've set up specific targets in their countries. And they may actually have additional incentive programs to help accelerate that in place. So it's rippling down from the global level all the way down to a city level in terms of initiatives and support that is being placed, that has been, has been put in place to help companies and municipalities implement the principles of the circular economy. And that's not all, right? Even in, you know, up, I think it's uh, it starts in a week and a half, right? But the joint conference for industrial engineers and operations managers, the big theme is around what are the challenges and trends for sustainability? So even at the academic, at the research sharing level, right? There's a whole theme around this where you get a lot of innovative ideas and researchers working on things that then because you've got platforms like the World Economic Forum that can help you know, broadcast those out to countries and to companies to adopt and learn how to implement. Now, again, all well and good. One thing that I learned at Intel a long time ago is to understand where the money is going, not where the money's been. So it's not, you know, look at the money flow or something like that to find a criminal, but look where the investment trend is in certain areas. And that's going to give you uh, someone the insight to where people are kind of placing their bets. And when you see an acceleration of investment in an area, that's where there's less risk 
because a lot more money is going there and they expect to be uh, expect to pay off there. So on the left hand side of this chart, these are well known equity funds that as part of the fund prospectus and the fund requirements have to be invested into the circular economy. Some have a sole focus, some have a partial, but you can see just in the past couple of years, the trajectory of money being made available, willing to invest into, into companies, be they startups or old existing companies to go do that. And speaking of some of the older companies, many of them have now put out corporate bonds with the intent of having uh, institutions invest in helping that company transition and implement circular economy principles, right? So the, the, the money's flowing, right? Okay, that's, uh, that's all well and good. A little thing here, I'm gonna ask you guys to come off and mute. Here's a whole bunch of headshots that came out of whether maybe LinkedIn, a few uh, company annual reports and so forth. Anyone have an idea of what is in common amongst all these people? I'll give you a hint. Engineers. What are they? Are they all industrial engineers? No, nope, good guess, but nope, they're not all industrial engineers. And these are all, these are all key executives at you know, Fortune 500 type global companies. List, listed in Are annual there reports. Who actually uh, came up with this uh, circular economy concept in their company? Very close. Yeah. So these, all these people are chief sustainability officers. And one thing that I learned working in a corporate environment for a long time is when you put someone in at a C level in a company, right? And the other note is most of these, have, have been put in their job in just the past couple of years. But when you create a new C-level organization with a, within a company, right? These people like to staff their organizations, right? To go work across the, the company, to go get implemented um, their strategies and their plans, right? So just in the past couple of years, there's been tremendous hiring or placement of chief sustainability officers at global um, and Fortune 500 companies. Right. So when that happens, then there's some real momentum because companies are putting their money and their pe uh, and people in where their mouth is. Right. So that's important. And that all sets up for this argument that I want to make that says there is a need out there for people with cir circular economy skills. Right. There's an article here from um, from a, a couple of years back. Right. And they paid it off. They, there's one. Um, website, the Circular Economy Club, is starting to track the circular jobs at, the, at a country level. So here's an example of Scotland. Out of the two and a half million jobs that exist in Scotland, they've been able to identify over 200,000 of those jobs are involved at some level in the circular economy, low level as well as executives, right? So these are people participating in the circular economy at companies or at government uh, agencies. In the Netherlands, out of almost 8 million jobs, 686,000 are related to the circular economy, right? So there are jobs emerging out there and are being tracked. So, you know, and, and again, if you think about it for a little bit, I'm guessing a fair number of you on the, on the meeting today are probably studying supply chain. And if you went to LinkedIn and you just typed in supply chain analyst, you know, you'd probably see 4,000 jobs pop up. At least it was this morning. If you type in sustainability analyst or consultant, you might see about a thousand combined. You go, wow, there's a lot more jobs in, in supply chain. Yeah, but I think if you consider it a little bit, there's a lot more people studying supply chain as a general topic, right? So there's a lot more people competing for those jobs, for those supply chain jobs, than engineers competing for jobs in sustainability in the circular economy. Right. It is it is a pretty specialized skill, and not that many universities at this point actually have degree programs in it. They've got classes, they've got their certification programs. I'll talk more about that in a minute. There is a growing set of opportunities to build some of those skills. The demand for those skills is far outseeding the supply at this point. Right. So if I think about what would be the opportunities for an industrial engineer or, or an OR uh, major 
who is interested in entering in the circular economy, where do you go about hunting for these? It could be in the financial segment, right? I showed that trend of investments being made towards ESG in the circular economy. Yeah, these are finance people. They may, they may not understand, they can probably understand complex finance systems, but they may not have any idea about complex supply chain, right? And being able to, is this a, a worthy place to invest? They're going to need someone with, you know, the engineering chops to go understand and dissect that supply chain and say, yeah, that's feasible. That's not right. Consultancy, Accenture, BCG, these companies are hiring like mad people with sustainability and circular economy skills because big companies with their chief sustainability officers are looking for guidance and looking for where do I start? Come in and examine my company. So consultancy agencies are hiring like crazy. Within companies, right? They're, as they rethink their you know, product life cycle work from the design through the development, the, the engineering, the ability for repair and reuse, right? They're looking for people that have an understanding of how it works and how to apply it as they look to adopt that. Logistics and supply chain is fairly obvious, right? Uh, but if you start looking for jobs in supply chain for sustainability and logistics, you'll find opportunities there and not a whole lot of people with the skills to go after it. A few times I mentioned additive manufacturing, right? It's being able to spread out, you know, where spare parts get made. Yeah. That, that, that takes a lot of skill to figure out, you know, where's the right place to put these around the world. You can't put a, a big metal printer um, in every city or every place where there's a Ford dealer, right? You've got to be able to figure out and do the work and say, where's the most logical place for that, the most cost-effective place for that, Mo the place that has the most efficiency when it comes to uh, transportation costs and, and low environmental impact. Government and policymaking as, a, as a, an entity to work for with the World Economic Forum, the EU, hopefully in the US, right? We're seeing in China also some significant investments uh, in this area. Government leaders, they know how to govern, but they may not have the expertise in shaping the policy correctly that can be implemented. So governments are looking for people with these skills to be able to come in and say, yes, these policies make sense, but you have to have the the engineering understanding in order to look at things, look at those complex systems and figure out where's the right way to draw the loops. What would be the right targets to set? What makes sense for what gets manufactured in, in this country or city or what gets used in this country or city, being able to do those analytics. And of course, entrepreneurs and startups. I mentioned Fat Llama. I, I wish there was a Fat Llama in the United States, but that's a new business that got created. Uh, someone had a great idea say, oh, why don't we figure out how to give people the opportunity to, you know, loan out, get a few dollars for that table saw that they use maybe once a year, right? Well, great. You got someone with a wonderful idea, right? Well, someone's got to figure out the logistics, right? Not just the website design, but the logistics. How do we, how do we handle all that? I actually think uh, an opportunity that's going to come up in a couple of years, and I haven't seen a whole lot of, whole lot of work done on this, um, but with the hundreds of thousands of electric vehicles being produced, I think there's going to be opportunity to recover those batteries and find use for them that don't require, you know, high cycle, right? You know, a, a car battery tends to get recharged, you know, just about every night, right? But there's a lot of opportunities for batteries where you don't have to cycle it every day. Think of backup generators, you know, right? What got me thinking about this is a long time ago, believe it or not, Intel, before it was called the cloud, put in place a big data center that, you know, people could, uh, could basically rent um, compute cycles on and storage type cycle time on. And as we were building it, an old general manager of mine, he got put in charge of it. He told me a story one day about how in order to put the backup system in place in case the power went out, they used a big jet engine, right, to, to power the generator, which then kept the data center running. But he said that the cost to maintain that because that jet engine needed to be run every so often and you needed to bring maintenance people out all the time to check it out and test it and all that sort of stuff. So that that cost 
was more per year than the actual cost of the generator. Well, now we've got battery technologies, right? That don't need to be charged every night, right? And, and those car batteries, you know, they're designed, right? And they, they reach their end of life because you can't cycle them and they don't hold a charge. But how do you repurpose all that batteries instead of throwing them into the landfill for other uses, right? Where it still makes sense. Just like being able to take two-year-old server boards that are not of value to Facebook anymore, but how do you resell those to uh, enterprises that need a server in infrastructure that, that will get value for the next five years um, out of a, a slightly older generation CPU. So I'm sure that there's a lot of opportunities out there and you know people might have the idea but not the not the skill, not the knowledge of how to go make it work. And that's where industrial engineers can come in and in, through understanding the principles and implementation case studies of the circular economy can apply those you know, even into startups. And the last is an academia. I have one example that just came across my desk uh, uh, a couple of weeks back. And I'll show it here, the University of College in London. It's got a postgrad opportunity for someone to come in and, and help them figure out you know, about circular metal opportunities, right? So even if you think you're looking for opportunities there, <coughs> and I didn't even go search for this, it's just hit, hit my inbox. I think because on LinkedIn, I have a skill listed for circular economy or something like that. So there are even opportunities in the, in the world of academia. Okay. So if I was at all successful and got someone interested, right, in exploring this a little further, as I mentioned, the a PDF is coming out from Srinivasan. All of these have links to the material behind it. So if you want to do a little research and learn a little bit more about it, because I, quite frankly, just scratched the surface here, there's some links to do some more research. If you're even interested in taking an online course, I've taken many of these personally, I uh, found them fascinating, learned a lot. Here's links to their those online classes. This one in the upper right is a 10-week program specifically for postgrads that the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is putting on. It's going to start in May. They just opened up the application window. Might be something that if someone really this summer, hey, I want to be able to take an online class, really get into this deeply, get a credential from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. It was probably the most globally recognized organization promoting the circular economy. You know, there's a path too. And then last, as Srinivasan mentioned, I chartered, <clears throat> excuse me, the Circular Economy Club uh, here at the university. In fact, it's the only circular economy club in the entire state of North Carolina. Um, and I just chartered it in January, didn't exist anywhere in North Carolina, let alone in NC State. My ambition with this club, right, is to provide a forum for students, professors, anyone that wants to explore the circular economy a little bit, maybe even go through a few workshops. I've got uh, um, a portfolio of, of workshop materials that we can we can use to explore and learn and understand how to implement it. Um, I can it's a forum where I can distribute a lot of case studies. We can even do some advocacy around the university. Uh, Dr. Joins, who's actually in the College of Textiles, he runs the textile chemistry. He's actually very very interested in, in reverse logistics for the textiles world, and he'd very much like to be part of this. You know, he said, hey, if you get some, if you get a little momentum going, you get a few students involved, he would like to bring in some of his work and some of his students who are particularly focused at logi reverse logistics for textiles, you know, to, to share and network and learn. And I think there's an opportunity to engage some local companies, again, because there's, there's not a real forum uh, around here to uh, discuss and describe and educate uh, companies on the benefits of the circular economy. I, I endeavor to put on some seminars maybe later this year um, when people can, can get in person, but I hope to, to get some companies uh, involved participating as, uh, as uh, in the audience to learn some of this stuff and figure out how the circular economy can help their business uh, in there. A few companies have already expressed interest to me that they'd be willing to sponsor an event. So I've tried to lay the foundation for some of that. And then last, using you know, the network of the Circular Economy Club would give participants, 
you know, access to um, earning some prof professional certifications. Again, there's not a lot of schools out there that where you can go get a, you know, major in, you know, sustainability or the circular economy. Uh, however, there are professional certifications that as you graduate with a supply chain degree, right, where certification in the supply chain that can, I mean, certification and circular economy type programs that can make one attractive to, um, to companies and governments and consultancies that are looking to hire people with these skills. All right. I've put a uh, contact uh, email down there. If anybody is interested in, in participating and working with me to go make something like this happen and be meaningful and effective, um, I'd love to hear from you and we can get going. So in summary, I explained the notion of the, the why we need to help get companies to move out of this linear economy and into the circular economy, right? Because it's going to have benefits not only to the company in terms of profitability, but to the earth, because we're just going to run out of those resources. Hopefully I shared with you the momentum that is building and that momentum that is building is creating opportunities and jobs because governments and companies are looking for people with these skills to help them do things. And I strongly believe that industrial engineers have some of the key foundational skills that if, a, that if applied with a layer of circular economy principles, have, you know, give, give someone the tools and the ability to go into a company or go into a government agency and help them figure out how to do it and how to do it well and effectively. And that's what I had to share. Thank you very much for your time. I'm, I'm really glad I had the opportunity to, to share this with you. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Thanks for your presentation. Any questions from the audience? I really think this is like, it's such a fascinating topic to just think about even like by yourself. I think a really big problem is that the general public is not really educated enough in these issues and these topics. Right. And what steps do you think as industrial engineers, what steps can we take to, to sort of uh, show them what's the reality of the situation? Well, I think for the consumer, it's going to take a little while. Unfortunately, I, this is one of those things where, you know, at the, at the government level, you know, with the actions, the World Economic Forum's taken a, a big chunk. I, I, I listened to a lot of the, the Davos. Davos is an event put on annually by the World Economic Forum. A lot of them talked about the need for sustainable companies and implementing sustainable techniques and using the methodology or the circular economy. That's got to start happening from the top down, right? And, and the only reason I believe this is for years and years and years or decades, the recycling symbol has been there, right? And some people are doing it, but, you know, it's, uh, what was the number? You know, 40 per, less than 40% of all plastics are recycled um, or less. So, you know, people aren't understanding that. Um, so I think that the advertising, the marketing, the awareness really has got to happen from the top down. Just the, the, Doing, doing it at the ground level is going to be very, very difficult because it, it's been hard to do that to begin with. The other thing that becomes interesting is because uh, of some work that I did Intel, a lot of consumers don't know what they need or don't know what they want until they see it. So when you've got new, um, new companies that can be created around using some of these principles, I mean, I wasn't kidding. When I came across a case study about flat, fat llama, the first thought I was, holy crap, what a great idea. Why isn't it in the US? You know, and I was immediately thinking of, oh, I've probably got a dozen things that I would be happy to catalog as something available to rent or borrow from me, right? Um, but until you, I was aware of it, I, I would have never thought to use the service. And then going back, it, it takes a while for a generational mindset change. I mean, I kid you not, I, I originally started out with the classic thinking, I contributed to e-waste being at Intel. I ought to do something about it. But fortunately, I came across this whole different way of thinking, right? Because e-waste, just in the old recycling way, how do we, where does product go? How do I extract out, you know, the copper, the lead, you know, something like that um, and break it down and get it back in. But there are so many other loops that can be done 
within a company that uh, it, it, it takes some discovery. It takes some discovery. And some people don't even know they're doing it, right? By participating in a bike share program using, using the Citrix bike share service instead of buying a bike, that's great. I mean, that is a, that is a perfect example of, a, of implementing a, one of the principles out of the circular economy because you're getting more use out of one bike instead of you know, everyone buying their own bike and barely using it. So I don't know if I've directly answered your question um, because I don't think there's an easy answer for it other than what's happened over the past two years in terms of momentum, it's gonna create action. And you know, while, while I might have a lot of hope that things like what the UK is trying to do with implementing repairability metrics on the outside of a box will give people some pause and say, well, I got to factor that into, into my purchase decision. You know, those are, those are little steps and a lot of them are going to need it, be needed. For sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your presentation. I just have one quick question for you. Yeah. Uh, in your view, uh, let's say from historic data, uh, how long do you think uh, companies take for their transition from a linear uh, economy to a circular economy in the past? And, uh, you know, what do you think is the role of industrial engineers that can help uh, make this transition happen faster? Right. Okay, good questions. So the, the length of time it takes really, really depends on the company's commitment. Um, there are some companies that may pursue it as, as let's explore it, let's pilot it. So they may take one product, one product line and see if it can be done. I, I think that is often difficult because there's so much infrastructure and of how things are done that to try to pilot it in isolation has given some people, uh, has, has caused it to cost more than it really needs to do. Uh, one of the reasons why I picked Rico as an example is because they went in as a full corporate commitment. They said, we've got to redesign the whole thing. We have to make a company commitment that this is how we're going to do business going forward. Because if you just isolate on a product or product line, you're really not going to be able to change the, the momentum and the way things are being done in the current supply chain and manufacturing process. It, it, will, be, it will be the exception rather than the rule in terms of how things get done within a company. right? So while it might be an easy decision for, you know, a finance manager, oh, I don't want to invest too much. There's too much change. Let's try a pilot. They're going to be disappointed in the pilot because they're not changing enough to see the real benefits of it. You got someone like a Rico that says, oh, uh, we're going to make a corporate commitment that we're going to redesign everything. They're seeing and realizing the benefits, but it took over five years for Rico to really get that going. Right, because you got to stop doing your old ways. You got transition period, but once they got going, it was great. So as they they added new products, it just went right into the new way of doing things. Um, you can look at Ford and say, well, yeah, we're maybe not going to redesign the whole company yet, but there is this problem area where we are building a whole lot of spare parts and shipping them all over the world to distribution centers and to dealers, and they may never get used. And dealers want to return them back to us. And what the heck are we going to do with it? Right? Why don't we? Think of doing um, our stocking repair parts in a completely different way and using just-in-time manufacturing with additive manufacturing uh, equipment to solve it that way. And that, and that does not take, that's only a couple of years for Ford to implement. Thank you. Right. Now, in terms of what industrial engineers can do, I I'm, I'm apologize. I guess I didn't, didn't do a very good job uh, in, my, in my thing. I think we've got some fundamental skills as IEs to look at these complex systems, to be able to look at areas like the supply chain and logistics side and be able to bring those skills to bear and saying, if we we're going to do things in a new way, this is how we do it. Because we can help people transition to the classical way, the traditional way of doing it. Because we understand the new way, we can help redesign that. Right, because we've got we've got those foundational skills. Got it. Thank you. Hello, Patrick. I have a quick question. Thank you so much for um, your presentation on this topic. This topic is really close to my heart, oh, and 
I wanted to discuss about the role of uh, transparency and information sharing in this process, especially from consumer side, as you said, that we look at that recycling symbol mm -hmm. and we try to do our part diligently. But then I would also like to, in the process from a customer's point of view, I would like to know that whether what I'm doing is right or not and how I can improve in this process. Right. So I'm kind of hoping that some of the work that the World Economic Forum is doing with their platform is to come up with easily identifiable symbols, right? That not only show recycling, but what are their aspects of the circular economy that that product has adopted that makes it better for the earth, right? Um, a lot of companies are trying that on their own, right? Um, immediately when I heard you say the word transparency, I, I think of documents, um, but really it's, it's at that product decision or product research phase that I think you're talking about. How do you make, how do you design some iconography, uh, icon, iconography, icons, right? That can be used in a product to explain, right? That this product has adopted these principles. These products use X percent of recycled materials. This product is refurbished, but works as good as new. Right. Um, one of the things that the World Economic Forum is trying to tackle is how do they how do they come up with some representative ways of explaining that? Because right now it's it's wild. Different companies are explaining it in different ways. And when there's a lack of consistency, it also means that people have different meanings of, of what that means. Right. Um, so I, I, there's not a good answer now. Right. My hope is, is, again, with the platform and the World Economic Forum, through all the companies that are participating and the organizations that are participating in it, they can come up with a set of icons or phrases, right, that have that form consistency. Because once you have consistency, then it has meaning and then it can influence people's product decisions. Yeah, sure. And even not even in terms of just symbols or like reading long reports on sustainability, because that is a good way to do it, but sometimes people might not want to read those long reports. I was yeah, thinking yeah, you don't have the time. Yeah, you don't have the time for that. Right. Yeah, I was thinking more in the terms of being more interactive, like rather than symbols. If I'm like recycling the uh, the waste, so I would get some kind of information from my app or something by digitally linking it. That how well I'm doing, and what is my carbon footprint, and you know how can I improve as individual because that will contribute collective thing. Yeah. So I, I've seen I, I've yeah. seen some work along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't study it. Um, I, I think there are people looking at that. You know, what what are your, what's your individual footprint, um, and what steps you can take to reduce your footprint. Um, I've I've seen some stuff there, but I'm not expert in it. Um, I, I will do a little bit of research on it and and see if I can come up with some stuff and and communicate it back to you. Sure. Like, for example, I saw an example of H&M, uh, the clothing retailer. So what they do is they encourage um, people to donate their, uh, to give their old clothes for recycling right. and they give some value back right. to the customer so that when they purchase new clothes, that can be used as points. But then I also saw a, a report or documentary which said that actually H&M is not recycling. Yeah. So I thought like more transparency in the process where if I give something or donate something, I have the transparency where it goes to the ultimate end and how yeah. it is used that will make me feel much better. Mm -hmm. as a And customer. Patagonia is trying to do that. That's part of their whole worn wear program, right? Is, is, they, is they let people feel good about Sending, sending the sweater or jacket back to Patagonia, right? Mm -hmm. And But they're able to quantify that, which is what I think you're looking for. How do you quantify? What do you know? How do you know that you're really helping the earth? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, thank you so Hi. much for the presentation. I just have one question. I mean, I was wondering um, for the whole time, uh, like uh, like we saw how the uh, recycle, refurbishment, and the remanufacture was helping cost savings for yes. the company. Yes. So, um, how do you how would you like measure it on an overall basis or on a resource consumption basis? Like not company to company, like because sustainability would be something that is related to resources from the earth. So, like. Is it possible to You mean in, in totality? 
totality yeah is it possible to I'm, measure I'm, it i'm sure at some level it's, it's possible um and that again might be something that might you know is, is attempted to be targeted at the eu level right by setting okay. targets in order to determine if they're meeting those targets they've got to audit them i don't know that it's being done on a global level i've just okay. seen examples at a country or a regional level where again, targets are put in place. China has something like this too, where they are trying to implement some targets and they have to, and, and therefore companies have to submit audits yeah. on how they've done things in the past, how they're doing it now in order for the, the governmental agencies to know, you know, how's the country doing at, at, at achieving those targets. Right. right? So, but, but behind all those targets, there is work that's saying, if I, if I reduce waste going to a landfill, what is the approximation for how much less material is being pulled from the earth based upon an allocation of different raw material goods of what's been historically going in and also what type of emissions are no longer going into the atmosphere. So okay. there, there, are, there are scientific estimations on that that okay. is behind the target setting. Okay. And, and I, I'll take a note and see if I can find that part of the European report. So like this, uh, the circular economy is basically something that comes from the European Union right now. It's well, majorly uh, there. So the European Union has is, is basically saying the circular economy, if we apply these principles, right, is going to help the earth and our, and our own sustainability and our own, you know, uh, uh, company's profitability. So they, they've said, yes, this is a path. And therefore, we're going to set targets to reduce wastes and landfill, right? Because a big thing that's happening in a lot of these countries, you know, they're running out of space to put stuff. I mean, some of this yeah. is actually happening because mm. of a problem, not just because it feels good, right? Yeah. But, you know, companies are running out of, where do, where do we put all this waste? Yes. And they're no longer feeling good about, oh, we'll, we'll put it on a barge and send it to some country in Africa that's willing to take it. Yeah. Right, they, they're not willing to do that anymore. So they're saying we, yeah. we're running out of space to put this, so we got to do something about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and just one more thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the recycled uh, products, how do they decide cost for that? And like, how how do they decide the cost for that product so that the customer will buy the recycled product? So. Well, if it's recycled, really the customer doesn't know that, right? Unless you advertise, okay. oh, this, this bottle is made <laughs> okay. out of 60% recycled plastic okay. material. Right. You might be thinking remanufactured or refurbished. Right, sorry, yeah. yeah. Doesn't so, matter. you know, yeah. they, it, like, like, like deciding what anything gets priced, right? You've got a, a product management team, right. right? That goes out and talks to potential customers and finds out what they're willing to pay for, right? Now, Caterpillar... Right. Caterpillar quietly will say they make a lot more money off of a, you know, one of their big heavy machines that have remanufactured engines, even though they're selling it at a lower okay. cost. Okay. So Caterpillar will tell the customer, hey, you're buying this big dump truck, but it's got a refurbished engine in it. A lot of other stuff may be new, but the engine's been refurbished. So we'll give you a discount on that. Oh, okay. Right. But, but, you know, on things like that, they, They've got to figure out what is what's the customer willing to pay for. Okay. Right. Thank hey, you. I'm I'm getting Trina about I'm getting a lot of phone calls from home. I have a feeling there might be a problem. Can I just mute you for a minute? Oh yeah, sure. I remember um, during my work experience with uh, Johnston Young. Uh, we had an opportunity to study the refurbishment of tires. Uh, and the tires are typically for uh, trucks and uh, lorries so that they don't go for buying a new tire because new tire cost around you know 50 60000 rupees i'm saying some 6 7 years back whereas this a refurbished tire it cost almost 50% of it like 30000 35000 and all and again please understand when when it is a large corporation like for example jp hunt and ch robinson kind of a companies where they have huge number of carriers. Whereas the companies, those were you know, selling their you know, carriers, they hardly have three, four trucks. It's not a big company, right? 
so for them to run the business uh, you know model to get the profit is more priority rather than to have a new product and a new uh, spare parts to run their business so what they will you know trade off is okay if i'm buying this refurb based tire how much is the life it is going to give if it is going to give life for another 3 to 4 years i'm anyway going to you know close down this line probably i'm looking for a new truck and stuff so in that sense people will look for this refurbished you no know, products tire is one classic example from india as well as a battery the automobile batteries you might be aware uh, especially for uh, trucks and car manufacturers they use this batteries as plenty of times they use this refurbished batteries simply to you know develop more value from the product at the, as well as they can save much better on the price i mean these two examples quickly i can think of from my experience thank you and i'm sorry about that i i i always know that if a phone call comes from home if they call back two or three times or something's going something's happening oh that's fine that's fine any other questions from audience i have one uh, request yeah. it's not a question actually uh, i have seen those uh, links uh, patrick regarding this uh, courses for uh, industrial engineers especially on circular economy and others and and all the courses are actually paid courses and it is almost like you know 1000 euros and you know 2000 dollars that kind of a course what no, the, i know that, is, i know the tu delft ones are not oh is it the tu delft ones yeah one of them i didn't even pay for uh one of them i paid i think 50 or 75 dollars to get the certificate oh uh, okay that is a different thing i'm talking about i mean the ones which i am saying is like a proper course uh, oh, they yeah. refer to some they refer to some 900 euros or something like that yeah there so there question, might be some the of that is, as well yeah if if there is something you know about some free certifications some kind of training materials for our industrial engineering students probably if you can forward that well that every, would every everything that i think is good i put the links in the in the pdf oh okay okay cuz i have found plenty of courses that look like all they did is regurgitate someone else's stuff and try to charge for it um but there are there are a lot of links to a bunch of research material that's all free both of the tu delf courses are free to take if you want a certification that you pass the course you know it's typical either edx or coursera or one of those costs right if you want a certification i i'm actually not aware of too many um universities that give certifications for free um mm. right I mean that's not very typical if because they because they've got to pay to maintain and and validate it. They got to pay people to grade courses or read essays and score it. Uh, but that's only if you get certification. You can you can take many of those courses for free. You just you just can't put a LinkedIn certification number. Oh yeah. Right. But but I but I know the TU Delft ones weren't very much because I I did them. I don't have a job. Um, you know, so I don't I I can't afford to pay thousand dollars for something like that. Oh yeah. I think we'll be able to audit the courses for free if I'm not wrong. Uh, yeah, like I, he said only if we have to get a certificate as such uh, we may need. Right. Pay. Right. And and I know one of them I I think it was designed for the circular economy. I I I took for free like an audit. I just didn't get a certification on it. Maybe at the end of this uh, presentation uh, Zoo will send the um presentation with all those links. all all of you maybe you can check your inbox and once you get the presentation there are so many links in the presentation so you can click each and every one go through whatever uh, patrick was referring to in terms of uh, research opportunities at uh, different forums including world economic forum and uh, allen macarthur foundation and followed by some of the courses which he mentioned delf and you know mcmaster and all Right. If someone is interested, uh, go ahead and uh, do this uh, course for your benefit. Yeah, and I think that Ellen MacArthur ten-week program that starts in May. I think that one's free, but they just have a limited number of students that are going to accept. You, uh, so you oh. got to apply for it. I, I believe it is free, and it and it's only eligible for postgraduate studies. Um, so, um, but you have to apply for it. So that they have a limited number of seats available. And, and I'm not. I'm. And by the way, I'm not going to charge anyone anything for the circular for the circular economy club. I just want oh. participation. Um, I'll take care of any cost to download worksheets and case studies and all that other stuff. And for the benefit of the participants today, 
um, if you wanted to know that the theoretical researchers what going on in terms of circular economy, I think you can just Google closed loop supply chain design, closed loop supply chain network design. I have done one small uh, math modeling and solved a problem in five years back. If you just Google what Patrick said, you will realize so many papers are published by authors from uh, European Union. Typically, all those countries in Norway, Sweden, uh, you know, yeah. this uh, Germany. They are, they are ahead of the curve. They are yes. absolutely ahead of the curve. Everyone else is catching up, which is why there's a lot of job opportunities. Correct. So you can just Google closed loop supply chain design. Uh, you will find plenty of papers with math models and applications so that it will be easy for you to follow up. Thank, thank you for that suggestion. Any other questions? Last few minutes. Actually, I do have one question. So Please, go have, ahead. Basically, we are saying about uh, shared economies, all things. And uh, we... Well, that, that's one aspect of it. Yeah. Right, that's, that's one loop of it. Yeah. Is the shared economy, yep. Yeah, so once we have... No, so now we have a coronavirus pandemic, so touching things might be a dangerous thing. Yeah. So, right. so some of that, some of that sharing might be on pause, but again, that's just one of the principles, one of the loops. Yep. Yeah. So, how would we would we consider those public uh, maintenance fee into the circular economy? What do you, I'm I'm not sure I understand public maintainer. Like uh, cleaning those cars bicycles. So. Oh, oh, yeah. So, so those companies absolutely have done that. Of course, they also recommend that you bring your own alcohol wipe and things like that too. But yeah, some of the, some of the larger companies, um, you know, like Lime, uh, it, it was a while back I read about that, but, you know, they send people out to go recharge the bikes. They, they made as part of that you know, if you're going to go recharge the bike, we're also asking you to wipe it down before you put the bike or put the scooter back on the sidewalk. And, but I don't know if they're, if Lime was paying the, because, because Lime will pay people to recharge, right? That's kind of how that works. You, you know, a lot of, a lot of people figured out how to make a fair bit of spare money recharging Lime scooters. I do know that they gave direction to those people um to to uh, sanitize them i don't know if the, i what i don't know is whether or not they paid more for that because i'm actually not a, a lime charger um so because their their pricing is is variable you know All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, participants, today. We had a wonderful session. At least uh, many of you, including me, we did not know the details of circular economy in terms of facts and figures. We once again thank uh, Patrick for his uh, time uh, and the way he explained the things in a, in a way people can understand easily. Uh, we hope to see you one more time, maybe if time permits, in a better occasion with a different topic. Yep. Thanks for coming and joining. Thank you for the opportunity. I was really glad to do it. Okay. Take care. Take care, Take care all. Bye-bye.